Okay, so we're at part five of our series, Six Glorious Galatian Gems. And we have taken one verse out of each of the six chapters, one a week, one per week. And what we have done is we have uh, looked at it and we have then looked at other scriptures surrounding it. And this morning, uh, we're going to look at Galatians chapter 5 and our verses, verse 25, the penultimate verse of the chapter. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let's read it again. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you'd take your own divine and inspired word, and Lord, that you would wing it to every single heart. And we pray this morning that you would open all of our eyes, that you would help us to receive this word and help us to walk before you every single day in the Holy Ghost for your glory, Lord Jesus, and for your honor and your name's sake alone we ask it. Amen. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Now, the five glorious Galatian gems last week, number four, we'll not go through them all again. I was told last week when I asked who took notes, someone messaged me and said, I had them too. There are people who took notes and I'll say who it was. And they says, I had notes too. They were just shy, they shouted up. Uh, but last week, if you remember, the subtitle is, you are no longer a slave but a son or a daughter of God. That was last week. You're no longer a slave but a son or a daughter. This week, this week is... Don't be led by your feelings and your emotions, your surroundings, but by the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'll tell you the subtitle again. Don't be led by your feelings and emotions or surroundings, but by the Holy Spirit. So if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We talk about walking in the Spirit. Sometimes we find that people use this uh, to be able to um, live a life that is completely off scale. What I mean by that, that, well, we're in the Spirit. So everything is so spiritual, there's no feet on terra firma. There's no balance in the life. And they're so spiritual, they become, uh, if you want, extreme charismatic to the point where life is a spiritual walk and nothing ever is real, nothing in your life can happen, no dangers are around you and all of this sort of stuff. Listen, you live in a world that's fallen and you're going to come across it even as we've heard this morning. Walking in the spirit is not always walking with our minds just thinking uh, candy floss things and the lovey dovey heart bursting bubbles all around us Walking in the Spirit is walking through your difficulties, trusting in the Lord Jesus in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is even when you can't see, you believe. When you can't trace, that is, that is you can't experience at that moment in time, you're feeling uh, as unsaved as the next carnal man beside you, yet you're still saved. Uh, and when you are like that, walking in the Spirit is trusting the Lord that the Spirit is within you. He has sealed you with his Holy Spirit Amen. until you come through that valley or trial. Walking in the Spirit here is ordering our lifestyle. Ordering our lifestyle. We live in a world now where because you're, I'll put it in the brackets again, under grace. We're all under grace, brothers and sisters. We're all living in grace. We're saved by sovereign grace and we're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. We don't doubt that. But people use it as a license to sin. People use it as a license for lasciviousness. People use it as a license to do as they will. Uh, well, the blood washes me and my life is covered in grace and sin abounds over my sin. And it does. 
But if you love Christ and you have the Spirit in you, he will lead you into all truth. He will lead you into right living. He will lead you into powerful walk. He'll lead you that you will walk with him, wanting to please your Father, wanting to walk in reverence and respect and in holiness. I still believe in holiness. I still believe in it. I believe it hasn't changed. It's man that has changed. Mindset has changed. Thinking has changed. Doctrine have even changed or twisted that they would be able to live as they like and do what they want and still say it's all right with God. So to order our lifestyle is to walk in the Spirit. What I mean is to walk in an open course of sin, a perpetual open course of sin. We all feel, every single one of us feel every day, and we live in grace. We are washed in the blood, and we're kept by God. We all feel. But yet because we feel, it doesn't mean to say we live in the failure either. But rather to be an overcomer. We overcome him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb. Doesn't stop there. By the word of our testimony. And testimonies are destroyed by how you live. Or how you don't live or should live and you shouldn't. What you shouldn't do. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimonies. And here's the more difficult one even. And they love not their lives unto the death. And the idea is that, you know, people think, well, if I was to go and be a martyr in one of these countries where Christians are slain, listen, you might become a martyr in your own country soon, never mind. But, you know, death, dying for Christ is, is a, we look at it in, in, a, in a Western, if we can call it modern society, we think of how cruel it is, and it is. And we think of how terrible it is, how fearful it would be. And it's, it's all of those things. But it's trusting Christ through those things that is walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit isn't always walking in the spiritual gifts either. We look at these things and living for Christ, and I want to say this in the right way, living for Christ may even be more difficult in a continual habitual walk with Christ than it would be to die for Christ. Because when you die for Christ, then you're absent from the body to be present with the Lord. And so you don't have the struggle anymore of that. It's that veil is the hard bit passing through. And listen, I don't want any of us to have to go through that. But ordering our life is to walk with Christ when we know things are against us, things are hard for us, lusts and desires and our wills and our wants. And it's the surrendering of the man, the surrendering of the woman, to the Lord Jesus Christ. That the Spirit of God who lives in you, that the same Holy Spirit, the eternal living God, lives in you, that he orders our life, and yet we find there's a war because of our body of flesh. Order your life. Order your life and let the Spirit move in your life. The idea here even as Paul would tell us is to walk in the Spirit. You know, there's a, a, a choice for the regenerate believer. Why I say regenerate? Because we're all dead in our trespasses and our sins. Don't know Christ, but when we come to know him and the Spirit brings life to us, then we are illuminated and we are enlightened and, and we are alive unto God. And so we learn from the Holy Spirit through his word, the leading, the guiding, and the flesh hates everything to do with the Spirit. For the life still speaks of the death that you were brought out of and spiritually, so your life still is dead until the resurrection of the body and the changing of the body. Don't want to go into that too much because we want to touch on some of that tonight. But notice here, when we are to order our life, our lifestyle is our thinking. Stinking thinking. <coughs> Who gets sometimes stinking thinking? And the other four are telling lies. <laughs> stinking thinking. What do I mean? It's not only the doubting that comes because the mind, the fleshy mind, will have you to doubt the things of God. The Spirit of God is the order of your life where those things are causing you to doubt. Stinking thinking can be when you, your, your mind has you, not just I'm talking about desires and, uh, and things like that, but stinking thinking can be that uh, you look at the world and everything is so 
and bad as we, we know and we hear, but yet you feel there's no hope for you. That's stinking thinking. When, when we're told that nothing can be done for a situation in a case, I don't give up until the Lord tells me to give up. I don't give up because once you give up, you're giving in to your thinking. The battle in your mind. Stinking thinking can be that you're uh, thinking of um, different desires of life. Different lusts of the flesh. It takes over the mind. takes you further than you ever meant to go. And when we walk in an open course of sin, that is habitually walking in that, Paul is saying, don't allow your flesh to order your life. Brother, sister, don't allow your flesh to order your life. But rather allow the Spirit of God to order your life. And everything that we are, and all we are. Since our life is new in Christ, walk in a straight line, someone once said. Don't be crooked. We're going to look at past life in a minute. And look, we've already looked at one of those, you know, our past is gone, is not right in Christ. But we're going to look at what we've been brought from. And then we look at our present life of, well, what are we like now? Has there been that change? And then say, has there been the struggle? Because there's always a struggle with something at some time. But not... Is our life different from where it was? So walk in a straight line, as one man once said. Walk to the best of your enhanced and spiritually sustained ability. In the previous, uh, previously, pardon me, in the chapter, if you let your eye run down to Galatians chapter 5, and that's just start at verse 16. Let's look at the battle, but let's look at what is in us still. And what being in us, the battle is going on, but where God brought us from. How we should be changed. Verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the loss of the flesh. You know, you you could spend so long in something carnally, carnal and fleshy, worldly, ungodly. I'm talking about even just in your workplace. And it pollutes your heart, uh, uh, pardon me, it pollutes your mind, and it affects your heart. Your thinking changes. In your workplace, some of you work in the most ungodly of places. And listen, that's what we do. We work in places like that. I worked in places like that. And what do you do when you come home from work and your mind's polluted by all the language and the talk that's went on and the things that's happened? What do you do when you're in the midst of all of that? Here's what you do. You walk in the spirit in the midst of it. How do I do that? It's simple. Obviously, we try and work along with our colleagues. I'm just using this for an example. It could be something else. When I was in secular work, what I used to do, if I was in a group here, say these, these two lovely gentlemen where I worked with were here and then there were two bad boys, mouth on them and talking about conquests at the weekend, I would have just turned my heel and walked away. And as I was walking away, I'd have said, Lord, purify my mind here. Cleanse my heart. Cover me. Cover me. And at lunchtime, I'd have took my Bible, depending on the day. Sometimes I went down to where their table was, and I sat down with my lunch, and I opened up my Bible. And if you can talk about the Word, guys, I want to talk about Christ. If you can talk about your conquests, I'll talk about him. And I got into some arguments or debates and I was told what I was thought of and how I I wasn't wanted, but they wanted me to join them. And that's the flesh, that's the world that we live in. Sometimes I just took my Bible and put it under my arm, shook the dust off my feet. 
And I just went down, out into my car to the car park, or outside on a good day, and I sat and read, and I sat and prayed, walking in the Spirit. I'm telling you, see by the time I was finished at lunch, I didn't even need to eat anything. I was already full. <laughs> I was already full. My heart was, was overflowing. And all these guys were doing all this, that, and the other. You know, some of the stuff I could tell you they'd done on me, it wasn't nice. I used to hang pornographic magazines up around my desk and all uh, sneakily before me coming in in the morning. And I used to do all this sort of stuff. But that was because I had a went then at lunchtime and went, I want to tell you about the Lord, boys. I want to tell you about Jesus. Trying to pollute my mind. Walk in the Spirit. Every chance you get, if you have a wee, if you're in an office or you're a cupboard or whatever you have, and I went in round behind a row of shelves in a place I worked in, and I used to stand behind, there was nobody about, and I used to stand and go, Lord, I just want to tell you I love you. I just want to tell you I love you. I'll see you later, Lord. Just loved him. Just loved him. Still do. Just loved him. I used to work in a, in a clothing, met gents outfitters in Lisburn. And I loved it when they asked me to go up to look for certain garments up in the store upstairs where they kept a lot of the suits. And I used to go up and go through the rails and I just say, I used to go, Jesus, I want to tell you, I just want to tell you for these couple of minutes how much I love you. I love you, Jesus. And I told him over and over again when I was looking, I love you, Lord. And then I realized I was around the wrong size. And we used to go, oh, no, my back this way, Lord. <laughs> Just walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit isn't necessarily you walking around up and down the streets and preaching and prophesying and all that sort of stuff. And listen, I'm okay with that. But that's not what it is. For your life, it is your heart the Holy Spirit within you and you have relationship with him. Walking down through the shops, you know, ladies, you know, you've got all your 10 bags on each side and you're thinking about the dinner and I know and you're thinking about getting home and you've got the day this, that and the other. Try this. Lord, that's a wee bit sexist, wasn't it? I should say amen too. You've got one bag, man. And I hope it's not a man bag. <laughs> and you're walking down with your bag. So you're walking down through the town. You're on your own, maybe. I just walk in my head and I'm saying, Lord, I was just thinking, you know, you showed me that word today. And what was it you were trying to tell me about that? You know, my boys see me, they say, that guy's cuckoo, you know. Relationship is you and him in the spirit of your mind and your heart, wherever you are. Someone once said, um, religion is sitting in church thinking about fishing. Religion is sitting in church thinking about fishing. Relationship is sitting, think, sitting fishing thinking about Christ. I'm not saying we'll have to go fishing and start thinking. You get the idea of it though? It's wherever you are, order your life. And the closer you get to him, Wherever you are, driving your car, everything. Listen, turn off the old radio. I, I, sometimes I'd get in and there's maybe some old stupid song. I just hit it right away. I don't listen to it. And I talk to the Lord everywhere I go. My prayer life, the Lord drives with me everywhere. He takes the wheel. Everywhere. Walking in the Spirit. Walk with Him every day. Commune with Him. <laughs> commune with Him, yes, in the closet. But commune with Him. Every single place you go. Order your life. And when these things happen, when these things come, you're fortified. You're fortified in the Spirit of God. So don't be led by feelings, emotions, or your surroundings even. I want to look uh, briefly at, at some of this in chapter 16, or pardon me, 5 and verse 16. This I say then, walk, order your life, it means. Walk. In the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the loss of the flesh. When you're tempted, when you're tried, when you're pulled this way and that way, get close to God. 
and you won't fulfill it. It's as simple as that. That makes you an overcomer. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now, we looked at this, at how the Judaizers were trying to turn them to Judaism. But Paul is coming with the gospel of grace found in Christ. That's the underlying thing of this because it was fleshy. That's religion is fleshy. Religion is, is about man, do, 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 do. Religion is all about uh, ceremony and ritual and all of this sort of stuff. Uh, but grace finds us and grace lifts us closer to God. Keeps us, even though we're in a body of flesh, we're still saved and going on with God. So the law is fleshy because it says do, 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 do. But grace in Christ says it is done. It's all done. Now the works of the flesh. So Paul gives us our past life. Which we struggle with in this life. But we should be overcoming. Because God is forming us to be like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For the next life. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness. Now they seem pretty, we know what they would be. We understand, I think, we understand what they are. Lasciviousness. Do you know what that means? It really means one who lives without restraint. One who lives without restraint. One which uh, shamelessly outrages public opinion. And all decency has gone from them. See the manner of people that we were in Christ has saved and forgiven and cleansed. That's why, that is the word that's there. That's where our fleshy, carnal feelings, will, and emotions from that surroundings wants to take us back into death and away from God. But if you walk in the Spirit, that will have no hold over you. Overcoming those things in God. Verse 20, idolatry. Buying at a statue. What helps us to venerate and helps us to worship and all this piffle. If you have the Spirit of God in you, you need none other, for He enables you to worship, as Rebecca is saying, we worship the Lamb of God. Witchcraft? Oh, well, you see. When we talk about witchcraft, we think of women with long, pointy noses and pointy hats, you know, the black hats and the odd wart on their face and the the long, spiky nails and the flannel broomstick and cackle around Halloween time. No. But that's the idea that people have in, in in their mind of it. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 7, please. Exodus chapter 7. Let's read just two verses. Verse 11. Let's read verse 10. And Moses and Aaron went in on the Pharaoh. And they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh. And before his servants and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. See the word enchantments? It's the corresponding Hebrew word for the word here for witchcraft in Galatians 5 and 20. It's the corresponding Old Testament Hebrew word. And really the the idea is here that it was something uh, that mimicked the things of God. 
things that seem are purported and portrayed that they are spiritual and of God and they are the work of Janes and Jambres. That is, the, these uh, sorcerers of Egypt. Teach us on that more sometime. They look at Satan himself as even transformed into an image of light or an angel of light. And it looks the part, but it's nothing but witchcraft and sorcery, even in the church. Go with me to verse 22 of the same chapter, please. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. That's the same word again, enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. Do you know what it does? Witchcraft, in this sense, hardens the heart rather than soften it toward God. The word here for witchcraft also is in corresponding in Isaiah 47. Isaiah 47. And verse 9, please. Now the Lord is speaking of Babylon and judgment on Babylon, Chaldea. That is that whole area. I think of the Babylon now, the system of Babylon, spiritual. It is not only global in the sense of monetary system. It's not only global in the sense of the, the one world government as in the gathering of the like of the European Union system, but it's also religious system. It's in the ecumenical movement. It, it comes and stems initially from the Roman church. <coughs> And now all religions are gathering together onto it. Let your eye run down, please, to verse 9. Here's a judgment on it. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment in one day, the loss of, the, of children and widowhood. They shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries. Now you need to stop here and think, since from this Old Testament time, still Babylon is in in the book of Revelation to the very last days that we're living in, right until the coming of Christ, where he smashes the whole system, we have to ask ourselves then, where are the sorceries? And you're seeing it all around you in the emerging church. Sorceries in in the ecumenical movement. Sorceries in the one world Jewish banking system. Sorceries in the European Union, the one world, one worlders, and the Lord says these sorceries there's going to come a perfect judgment upon them. That's why, I know I'm hammering on again. That's why we need the UK to be out of the EU. I know they talk about money and this, that, and the other. Listen, their souls of men and women are at stake, and there's a hellfire judgment to be had. For those who will be in Babylon. Anyway, it's going to fall. Europe's going to come down. The Lord said it. The Lord said he's going to smash it. So we're better out of it before it gets smashed. I'm going to do a different angle. Let's go on somewhere else. I'm going somewhere else. So here we have their sorceries. And for their great abundance of thine enchantments. Great abundance of enchantments. You know when we see spiritual enchantments. We're seeing it today in the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation, spiritual enchantments. The word witchcraft in uh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 20 is the word pharmakia. I want the young people especially to listen to this. Especially you young people. I want you to listen. Don't want you to miss Something that I'm going to say here, okay? That's for all of us, but every young person, I want you to take note, especially the, the, if I can call it, the older, younger ones. The word pharmacia is where we get our word pharmacy. As you go to the pharmacy, you're not well, and you get something from the doctor, the script. But the idea here for pharmacia or witchcraft is enchantment 
or dancing while on drugs is witchcraft. Did you hear that, young people? Taking drugs is witchcraft in God's eyes. You don't need the broomstick and you don't need the pointy hats and you don't need to grow a big nose and you don't need to have the warts on the face and the long black fingernails and all of that stuff which some people have. Taking drugs and dancing to the tune is witchcraft. Now listen, I was there. I know. I know. And before I got saved, I had a visitation from a big black demon. And he tried to take my life from me. So especially younger people, listen. Don't miss this. That black demon is from the pit of hell itself. And he wants to take you, so you make sure you're in Christ. And you don't get up to those things. It's witchcraft in the eyes of God. Also it speaks of uh, all drugs. As in even drugs for the good or drugs for the bad. But people, uh, the Lord used medicines throughout the scripture too. So it doesn't mean that you're in witchcraft if you're taking something for an illness. God told Isaiah to tell the servants of Hezekiah, the, the king, to go and make a poultice, a, a form of a medicine, and put it on Hezekiah's uh, tumor, and he would heal him, and he did. And, uh, and Hezekiah was given 15 years. There was a medical uh, application for it. But the word that Paul uses here gives the idea that those who are taking drugs for, if you want, enhancement, for hallucination, for dancing and that sort of stuff. Listen, alcohol is a drug. It's not right, Christian. Alcohol is a drug. And many Christian churches are saying it's all right to take their drugs. The Lord calls it witchcraft. Sort of brought the mood down a bit there, didn't it? But that's the truth. The idea here is that there were those on the Galatian church who still thought, just like many of the church today, we can still go out in our parties on Saturday nights and still be around the Lord's table on a Sunday morning. Listen, the Lord says, well, you were dancing with the devil last night. Do you want to come and sit at my feet this morning? He goes on to say, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, See the words here, uh, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The idea was that that's who the world is. That's what society offers. That's who you once were. That's who I was. I can say like Paul, I was the chiefest of sinners. That's who I was. But in Christ, I've come repentant to the cross, washed in the blood of the Lamb. The Holy Spirit lives in me. And in Christ, my life is changed. My life is different. So then we look at ourselves and you look at yourself and say, has mine changed? Am I different? I didn't say you're perfect. 
because none of us are. I didn't say, uh, do you not fail? You don't fail because we all do. It's ordering our lives, walking in an open course of sin. That's our past life. And the man and the woman who says, well, I got saved and there's no change in life. Simple. No, no change, no Christ. No change, there's no Christ. I remember uh, not so long ago, I was sitting speaking to someone and something that upset how they had failed in a certain issue. It wasn't a big issue, but it was to them. And I thought it was really pretty tame uh, to want for another word. And uh, they thought they'd failed big time and they were so discouraged and they were so disheartened. And I said, you know, you should rejoice in how you're feeling. Because if you weren't saved, you wouldn't feel like this now. If you weren't saved, you wouldn't have the conviction of heart. If you weren't saved, you wouldn't want the change. So maybe you're feeling I've let the Lord down. When you rejoice because you know it, then do something with it and go on and walk in the Spirit. We all let him down. Notice what we should be. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy. Peace. Long-suffering. Gentleness. Goodness. Faith. Now, some of us struggle, don't we? This fruit is a fruit with nine segments, if you want. Some of us have one segment, two segments. Maybe really, really real spiritual ones have eight segments. I don't know. But there's none can have 10 segments 24-7. Because see if you can keep these nine fruit of the Spirit. And please, let's strive to. But see if we were able 24-7 to keep the nine fruit of the Spirit all of our life in thought, word, deed, in action. You know what you've done? You've been able to keep the perfect law of God. But we can't. Sure we can't. See, the law points to the old person and says, that's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. The Spirit says, no, this is who I'm making you to be. This is who you're becoming. This is how you're being fashioned. This is how you're being formed. And your mind is changing and your heart is changing and your will is changing. Your desires are changing. Your thought process is changing. And it's all to the glory of Christ in your life. And notice what he says, and we finish with this. Verse 23, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. That's why Paul says against such there is no law. For if you're able to keep all of these, you've kept the law. Basically, that's what he's saying. But everything here, and that which we fail at, everything here was kept by the perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God. <coughs> The law and the fruit. He just kept the fruit or showed the fruit, manifest the fruit of the Spirit, and he fulfilled the whole law of God. Isn't that fantastic? Meekness and temperance. Finish with this thought. Temperance here means possessing power but having the mastery over it. For example, write it down. You don't need to. You can read it when you go home. First Corinthians chapter seven and verse nine speaks of having the victory over sexual desire. Over sexual desire, having the mastery over it, being temperate, which means you contain yourself. Why? Because you're walking in the Spirit. Because you're close to Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25, it speaks of an athlete overcoming his bodily temptations while training for the games. Read it when you go home. It speaks of him striving for masteries. It means he's told how to eat, what to eat, when to eat, when to sleep, when to get up, how to train, and he's pushed every step of the way until he's fitted out and perfected for the games that lie ahead. That's what Christ is doing in you, brother. That's why it's hard, sister. That's why sometimes we just feel like throwing the head up. That's why we struggle at times because the Holy Spirit is working in you and the flesh is crying out against it and the devil is trying to get, as it were, the crowbar in and pry you away from it all. That's why it's so hard. You're striving for masteries. Read it when you go home. 
but we become temperate. It means that the Holy Ghost is working in us to bring us into a perfect relationship with God and to conform us to the image of the Son of God. God is making you to be more like his son. You know what meekness and even temperance is when they work together? People think meek means you're weak. Not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. Moses was meek. We talk about meek as Moses, don't we? The Bible speaks of Moses being meek. Do you think he was weak? Moses was a, Moses was a terrified you sometimes the way he got on. He wasn't. He wasn't a walkover. Meekness isn't about being a walkover. Meekness is strength under control, power under control, and temperance is being able to contain that power. It's controlled, and your meekness is how you show your gentleness. And the temperance is like the wall that holds it back, and you're able to say, "Well, I'll deal with this differently." So, we're going to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. And we're going to take that as a gem for our life to say, Lord, help me, work in me, that I may become more like him, Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, everyone. God bless his word. Time is flowing.